really started to feel that when I made that first move, I needed to find a path that was my own. The first 14 years, it was very dictated. Um, how we trained, what we trained, what we learned, what we were allowed to be exposed to. Um, and I call it the AOL of, uh, of karate. You know, if you look back to the early days, as you know, I'm an IT professional uh, by craft, but back in the old days, AOL was, you know, the internet's a, a deep, dark, bad place out there. AOL will show you the only the things you need to, to know. And that was kind of the way I felt uh, about the, the training. I want to thank you for taking the time to be on the podcast. I'm looking forward to this. I have my my cup of joe, as they say, across the border from you. And likewise, I hope you have a beverage. Or as you've called it, I've seen you've called it, you don't call it coffee, you call it emotional support. <laughs> um, thank you so much. For, thank you so much for being here, Sensei. How are you doing? I'm great, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. This is wonderful. Well, I mean, you know, I think... The fact that I sent you that check for four point five million, it may have may have loosened your resolve a little bit. So thank you. <laughs> no, it's great to be here, and uh, you know, thoroughly enjoy listening to the podcast, and and very honored to be uh, to ask to contribute. It's, um, what is the story with the way of the hobo? We did that the hobo. I'm almost pronouncing it like a hobo. So the hobo, I, I think, is a really intriguing thing, and um, yeah, just the ifs, ands, buts, where's and whys, and your time begins now. Sure. So I've been training a little over 25 years. Uh, and for the first 14 years was part of an organization that was kind of a spin-off of North American Goju Kai. And uh, for a number of reasons, I moved on from there and uh, was first introduced to Okinawan Goju. -ru. Now I'm a, a Goju -ru practitioner. And after leaving that organization, I was I was with my first um, Okinawan Goju -ru sensei. Uh, who unfortunately was losing his eyesight. And so it was very difficult uh, in many ways for him to continue teaching and so on, although, although he do, you know, still does teach a little bit. But I really started to feel that when I made that first move, I needed to find a path that was my own. The first 14 years, it was very dictated. Um, how we trained, what we trained, what we learned, what we were allowed to be exposed to. Um, and I call it the AOL of... Uh, of karate. You know, if you look back to the early days, as you know, I'm an IT professional uh, by craft, but back in the old days, AOL was, you know, the internet's a, a deep, dark, bad place out there. AOL will show you the only the things you need to, to know. And that was kind of the way I felt uh, about the, the training. Not that it wasn't good training, not that I didn't learn a lot. And I'm, I'm certainly very grateful I wouldn't be where I am now without that. But I started to realize that there was a lot out there that I needed to, to start to get involved with. <clears throat> and around the same time that I was kind of starting to, to move away from that sensei, uh, my wife was on Facebook. I, I was totally anti-social media, which anyone who knows me, you know, knows me now would laugh at. Um, but I only really started to, to look around Facebook and started seeing different senseis and different things out there. And when I founded Shoshinkan in 2011, um, it, as I told you, I never intended to have a, um, a dojo per se. I thought of it as a training group or, or almost a cat rescue uh, where we would get people together who wanted to come and share. And it, it didn't have to be terribly formal or, or political or anything. But all of a sudden, I started meeting people online. And, and one of the first senior people I ever met was uh, Kinjotsunya sensei of the Jumakan. You know, at the time, an eighth den, now a ninth den. And it's wonderful when you're, you know, a Nidan and naive and ignorant enough in the ways of the, the political world out there that you just don't message a sensei and say, hi, how are you? And I started having some of these conversations, much to some people's chagrin, I'm sure, and found that they were more than happy to talk and share. And ultimately, Kinjo Sensei said, look, we're coming to Canada. 
um, we're not doing anything in Toronto. Would you like to host us? And I went, sure, let's do it. Uh, not knowing that that's, again, not supposed to be something that a Nidon does at the time. And uh, what I discovered is I was moving along my path here is that martial arts was so much bigger and broader than I had been exposed to in the past. And that maybe before running to get into a relationship with another organization or another group or another specific dojo, it was time to kind of look around a little bit. And so I started building these relationships, being tomodach, being friend and, and walking beside people, sort of um, friend to many, beholden to none at that point. And also wanting to expand my interests because my interests were also in Kobudo and certain schools of Okinawan Goju, you know, they don't do. Kobudo was part of their, their curriculum or part of what they see. Um, so it was really kind of expanding my mind that way. And I started to, to build relationships with other groups of senseis, with Sensei Paul and Michelle Enfield in San Diego, uh, you know, and Sensei Ronnie Kluger in Israel and, and so on. And certainly when I was uh, introduced to uh, Hanchi Cesar Burkowski here in Toronto and, and started to, to get to know him and he was very kind in sharing with me, one of the things that I discovered is that there are more of us probably than we are aware of who are kind of searching our own path. We may be part of an organization, but still pursuing our own, uh, our own journey. And Miyagi Ch you know, Chojin Sensei said that we are to be responsible for our own karate and our own training. And I remember sitting around uh, the bonfire out in our backyard here. We had uh, Sensei Paul and Sensei Michelle Enfield join us in October of 2015. And they had just started teaching internationally. And we were talking about this idea of being able to get groups of people together. We'd had a, a wonderful weekend of about a, probably 75 or 80 people from 15 different organizations. And it, it was very easy to park your ego at the door, park your politics at the door, you know, and, and you punch, I punch, you kick, I kick, we're best friends. Uh, and, and we kind of were lament, lamenting the fact that so often organizations get caught up in politics or lack of, of just common sense. And we, we jokingly threw about the term hobo. And the next day I happened to go on the internet and discovered that in 1848, there was actually a hobo constitution in the United States. So these guys who rode the rails and everybody thinks of, you know, with their, their I guess it's their bow over their shoulder with their little handkerchief. Um, these guys actually had an organization and a constitution and a methodology and a code of ethics and a code of honor that said, leave where you go better than you arrived there. Don't make things difficult for anyone. Look out for women and children. And all of a sudden it was like, being a hobo was a good thing. Most people think of Ronan and think of, oh, you're a disgraced samurai. No, no, no. This was wanting to travel a path that was self-directed um, and, and training and learning with and from other people who have the same good heart and good spirit to share in a spirit of fellowship rather than you've got to be part of my organization or you've got to buy this series of tapes or whatever the case may be. So that's where the, the whole hobo thing came about. Um, and then ultimately for me, it found its, its fruition in becoming a direct student of Hokama Tetsuhiro Sensei from Okinawa. Um, sensei is very, very supportive of people having their own path, having their own vision and supporting that literally to the point where if you ask Sensei a question and he goes, well, that's a great question. I don't know. His grandson lives down the road. Let's go ask. So he's very supportive of that. Uh, and, and to me, that has become really the path I didn't know that I was supposed to be on. That's where I've ended up. And one of the experiences you had, especially around the, as a lowly Nidan, I remember thinking if you got, to, I remember thinking people were gods when they were brown belt. So that whole, oh, as a lowly Nidan, you don't approach, approach a seventh, a sixth or seventh down. I think, I, from to my mind, I think that's something which seems to people have seemed to have adopted. I don't know if that's actually the case or it's part of the culture. Certainly, respect is implicit. I think that for me, one of the things that I find really encouraging is the fact that you've taken responsibility for your own learning, and you've taken responsibility for trying to create respectful, meaningful relationships, and this has kind of been the fruit of that. So. In terms of you striking out, for want of a better term, on your own, seeking the hobo path, were there naysayers? Were there people who kind of just 
um, couldn't catch the idea where there were people saying, oh, you can't do that. And we, we don't do things like that. Very much so. Uh, <laughs> and, and the pause there was deliberate. Definitely. There, there are people, what do you mean you're on your own? Um, you've got to be part of a big organization. You've got to have, you know, a direct idea of what you're doing. It's got to be so easily dictated down. That was a lot of it. Um, and I think there were people... I think there were people who were threatened by it and should never have been threatened by it. There were people who were confused and couldn't see how could you do this. Um, and it wasn't really until my first trip to Okinawa when I discovered that so many of the masters that we've all held up on pedestals for so long, that's what they did. They learned from someone and that, you know, Higuyo Nakanro sensei learned here and then went to China and went to, it's the same thing. And so often I think People are sometimes threatened by it. Um, it's easy to mock that, oh, he hasn't got a sensei. I was lucky. I had a number of people who were, you know, very dear personal senseis as well as, as karate sensei, um, supporting and guiding and not afraid to box me around the ears a little bit if I, they didn't feel I was doing things correctly. But it was, it really helped me get an understanding of what goju meant to me and what my goju meant to me. And what that looked like. And, and sometimes I think, you know, the, the life unexamined isn't worth living. There's a certain point when you're part of a large organization. There's nothing wrong with being a large organization. At what point should people start thinking that maybe it's time for a change? What, what would, if you had to sort of say, well, maybe this is time for you to start reconsidering where you're at and what you're doing. What, how would you, if someone came to you, and I, I think we've spoken a couple of times where people have actually approached you, um, on a private capacity to ask you just that what what's your advice for that well i think it, it's interesting i've seen with some organizations where you're able to stay part of that organization and still have an independent mind and still have independent pursuits and i i think that's wonderful but you know i know of a number of people who are part of a very large organization here in canada who their interests versus the interests of the head of the organization you know coincide 85, 90% of the time, but that 10% of difference where your style of Kobodo is slightly different than my style of Kobodo, great. We can all learn together. You know, um, as one of my mentors said, it, it's better to feast on a banquet of plenty than fight over crumbs under the table. Ooh, I'm going to put that on t shirt Well, but it's one of those things where I think sometimes if the organization or the, or the personalities don't allow for that, you have to decide where you want and what your karate means to you. And for me, you know, we, we've talked about it a little bit that one day I kind of came to two images that really described to me the martial arts. The first one was a prism. Now one side of the prism, you have light and it's all white and coming out the other side, you've got all these colors. And we can call those colors jujitsu, aikido, judo, karate, whatever it's still the same thing. And if you ask an Okinawan, so karate, you punch and kick. Yes. And grapple and choke and, 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 you know, karate is a complete full system. It's us who have given those labels. It's not the art, but the one that I, that I tend to talk about is I think of Goju as an elephant. It's gray. It has big ears. It has a little tail. It has a big trunk. And you can talk about any one of those pieces and you're correct. But to fully understand the elephant, you have to research and, and get to know all those parts. And so that's, I think that's what sometimes people don't understand. Hobo in no way is, is intended to, to look down or be disrespectful to, to having a full sensei. And, I, and I'm very, very fortunate um, in, in with the people who are, who are my sensei um, and, and my mentors and my senpai. But I think for my exploration of Goju and for my understanding of it and to be a better to be a better sensei, I needed to go about it and find it, you know, what that path was for me. And as a result, it's been this ongoing growth with our dojo, you know, over the 10 years of kind of figuring it out. And ultimately we're kind of a blend of karate do post-World War II self-perfection. Wow, that's a beautiful stance, along with you know, pre-World War II, Higaseko, Hokama Sensei, just badass karate jutsu. Top three. Wow. Well, obviously, Hokama Sensei, you know, it is 
incredibly supportive both of what we do here as well as everything in in okinawa um if i had to pick um and and it's two groups but three people um certainly uh hunchy caesar Burkowski of northern karate here in, in canada a phenomenal organization um Burkowski sensei is you know a legend uh, and he's been very kind in being a personal mentor a, a a personal friend, uh, but also a, a wonderful um, instructor who's taken me under his wing. Uh, his organization, uh, I'm kind of that weird goju cousin who shows up at things, um, but you know, he's, he's been very supportive of, of everything I've tried to do for my students, for myself, as well as you know, contributing whatever little I can for, for Karate in Canada. The other is definitely um, Sensei Paul and Sensei Michelle Enfield uh, in San Diego. Um, Enfield Sensei is incredibly talented, incredibly creative um, as a husband and wife team and as, as two just magnificent Sensei. Um, they are so talented, so giving, and really helped me as we started to, to build out more and more of this sense of dojo identity and, and what our, you know, we have a very family oriented community feel to our dojo. And, and that's something that the Enfields have, have definitely supported and have you know supported in visiting us. I think it's been four times they've come now and we've hosted them here. Um, but as far as you know, bunkai study again, bunkai not being application, it's being that that studying and having a, a kenku kai type of idea where it's a study group uh, and you need to peel back the layers of everything that we do. Um, I remember Sensei Paul saying one time. You know, if you've got a question about it, ask the kata. The kata will tell you where it is, which ended up in being a, a bit of a spin-off t-shirt where we just did a straight out of kata that looks like uh, straight out of Compton. But, you know, he's he's so creative and so um, ingenious in taking a, an incredibly deep knowledge of goju uh, and then teaching us ourselves how to go and explore what those katas are. Um, I think that's, you know, those people have definitely been the biggest influences on me, certainly in the last 10 years. Um, so outside of Karate Sensei, who would you say have been people that have been huge and influential and supportive? I, I couldn't have done any of this uh, without Rebecca, my wife. Uh, she has been incredibly um, positive and encouraging uh, and supportive. Like I say, she's, she's hosted Sensei when I've been out of the country. Uh, on business. Um, she, when someone comes to visit, uh, there is a, a spread put on here and normally a party for 60 or 70 or 100 people after training. Um, I couldn't do those things uh, without Rebecca's support in it as well. Um, and there are some people that I've met um, through my, my career. Um, and, and, and to call it a mentorship or anything would be far over it. I've had uh, wonderful managers uh, you know, I, I once worked for a fellow who was a Navy SEAL. There's no such thing as a former Navy SEAL, but he really taught me about team building and about how to bring out the best in people. Um, those sorts of people have, have always really uh, made me stretch to try and become a better person in every aspect. Wow. That, that's a pretty impressive list. I mean, both in karate and outside of it. Uh, there's, you know, I think sometimes we kind of forget the people that allow us, and I do mean allow us, that support us and our family, um, people who love us and people who allow us to have time away from them doing this crazy thing, this crazy thing where we're learning these techniques that can disable, cripple and kill people that we never want to use in a fight we don't want to have. And it's this kind of thing from uh, where we have just so many wonderful people. I'm glad that first and foremost, you know, you spoke um, well of your wife. I mean, that's a pretty amazing, that's a pretty amazing sensei right there. And there's been many times when I've wanted to uh, give up. I can actually say that some of our conversations have actually gone, right, I need to get out and put my 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 gown. So if you've motivated me on a number of occasions, what keeps you in the dojo? What keeps you moving and grooving and kicking ass? <laughs> well, and it's, it's funny you say that. I mean, over the years, I think we all hit plateaus where we wonder what are we doing and, and why are we still doing this thing? Um, I, I, without a shred of a doubt, um, karate has been a vital part of my, my mental, physical, psychological health 
through the 25 years that I've trained. Um, it has been a refuge. It's a sanctuary. Um, but I think it's funny, you know, I'm, I'm in my, as, as I prefer to call it, my late 40 teens. Um, and, and those things are starting to happen more. You know, they, they, there's been the, the, this injury or that injury I pulled back. Uh, most recently, the, the detached retina um, before Christmas, which was delightful. And I don't even have a good story behind it. It just happened. But I think there's two things. A, remembering how good we feel when we do train. And be having someone who will gently kick us in the butt and say, you need to go train. Uh, and, and again, Rebecca will happily tell me, you know, you know what? You need to go train. And we have no excuse. We're really lucky where we are here. Um, our dojo's in our house. Uh, you know, we live in a 160-year-old farmhouse uh, on the north end of Toronto. And we, we used to have a commercial space. Rebecca's a, a full-time yoga instructor. And we converted one of the basements into a, a dojo and yoga studio. So I don't have an excuse to not be training. And so that ability that, uh, you know, when I go down in the morning and I put coffee on, if I haven't remembered to put it on timer the night before, I can go through Sanchin and Tensho and a couple other kata while the coffee brews. And so literally just sneak downstairs and, and do that. And to have that ongoing, I would say over the last six years that we've been here, I've learned two things. First of all, I've learned that my karate is really a practice. It's like a meditation practice or a yoga practice or anything like that. I, tr I need to treat it that way for it to have the best impact on my life. That it's something I need to consistently do. I need to do it no matter how I feel. And even on those days, and, and you know, we've talked about this, and I, I know you've spoken about it on the podcast before, on the days when you don't feel like it are the days you need to train the most. And so having that, there's no excuse. The dojo's downstairs. Go hit the makiwara. Go you know, go do Sanchin a few times, go crank out a couple of, of Kobodo Katas. But also when we moved to this house, it became really personal to me that karate is so much bigger than any of us individually or what we're doing even currently. <clears throat> and I say that because in this house, you know, this house was built four years before Canada was a country. It was built five years before the Meiji Restoration. It was built when Abraham Lincoln was president of the US. As much as technically we own this house. I'm much more of a custodian of something that has been here long before me and hopefully will be here long after me. And that's really as sensei and as serious practitioners, what we're doing with our art as well. We don't own this. We're here to carry this and care for it and nurture it and hopefully leave it a little bit better and certainly no worse than what was handed to us.